Okay, so welcome to this next video in the car in the playlist on the cardiovascular system. Uh, in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to put together all of the stuff that we've seen so far uh, into what it actually means for the cardiovascular system. In this video, we're going to talk about how um, how nitric oxide is important in regulating blood pressure. So we're going to talk about nitric oxide and blood pressure. That's the topic for this video. Now, even though in this video we're really putting together absolutely everything, it should not be too necessary to have watched the previous videos in order to understand this. This video will stand alone. However, uh, the details are we're not going to go into at all, so it's going to be very sort of standing back, avoiding the molecular details, and looking at the bigger picture, basically, what it means to the macroscopic cardiovascular system, rather than faffing about with the molecular mechanisms of how sheer stress causes the release of nitric oxide, and then how nitric oxide actually causes vaso dilatation by acting on the smooth muscle cells. We're not going to look into the molecular details of it. If you want to see that, watch my previous videos. Um, but we're going to look at the more macroscopic um, viewpoint and see what this means for the cardiovascular system as a whole and how it helps us to regulate blood pressure. Okay, so the structure for this video then. We're going to have a basic reminder of the hemodynamic model. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to discuss, well, what happens basically uh, when blood pressure goes up and how nitric oxide is going to help you respond to that. And it's really basically a way by which the cardiovascular system alone can handle blood pressure going up. So we know there are all these uh, other systems involved in what regulating blood pressure that all involve the brain in some way generally. Uh, whereas this mechanism is basically a way that the cardiovascular system can uh, meet, uh, well, can modulate blood pressure on its own, basically. So it's a way that it can, it's an intrinsic way for modulating blood pressure, okay? And then finally, we're going to have a look at what happens if you inhibit it. Okay, so the hemodynamic model then, the basic hemodynamic model. So the basic hemodynamic model is that basically there are two systems, okay? So I'll draw them as two boxes to make this very, very simple. So we'll make this as simple as possible. Okay, so we'll let this represent the arterial system over here. Okay, so this represents, you know, the aorta, the massive great arteries, the brachiocephalic artery, the subclavian arteries, the carotid arteries, the renal arteries, the mesenteric arteries, these huge great arteries, the iliac arteries, big arteries, that they're now being represented as this box here, which we're just calling the arterial system. Okay, and then there's another box over here, which is the venous system. Now, this represents the big veins, the vena cavae, uh, superior and inferior, um, the azygous vein, the brachiocephalic veins, the iliac veins, big veins, basically. Okay, right, so... Um, what we're now going to do is we're going to put a tube in between these. So the arterial system is connected to the venous system. So blood can move between the arterial and the venous system. Okay, right. And this is a narrow tube, basically. This represents the arterioles. This is the arterial right over here. Okay, so this is the arterial. And then more in the middle here. This is the capillary, and I'm sorry about the alarm going off outside. I assure you, I'm in no danger. Uh, and then more over towards the venous system, this is a venule here. Okay, so these are the tubes connecting the arterial system to the venous system. Okay, so now the basic hemodynamic model is this. Let's say, originally, we start off with blood in uh, this entire system. And let's say we leave it completely in equilibrium, okay? So you've got blood in here, blood in here, and we let it just equilibrate. So the pressure of the arterial system is going to be equal to the pressure of the venous system, and you're going to have no net 
flow through this tube. You'll have a little bit of blood in this tube, but you're going to have no net flow because the pressure of both of these systems is going to be equal to one another. Okay, now, let's put in a new thing in here. Let's have this box in here, which represents the heart, the myocardium here. So this is the heart. Now, ah, good, it's gone off. Now, um, what's going to happen is the heart is basically going to grab a load of blood from, oh, not from here, from here. It's going to grab a load of blood from the venous system, okay, and it's going to pump it into the arterial system. And it's going to do this roughly every second. So every second it's going to grab a certain stroke volume, as it's called, which is the amount of blood that the heart ejects in each beat. Stroke volume, often abbreviated as SV. And it's going to grab a stroke volume and it's going to take it from the venous side to the arterial side. Now, for our basic hemodynamic model, I don't care that there is the pulmonary circulation in between here. I just care about the arterial system and the venous system. Yes, okay, it gets oxygenated in between, but the pulmonary system is effectively a totally, a totally different, separate uh, cardiovascular system. We're just looking at this bigger one here, the main systemic circulation. Okay, so you grab blood from the venous system and you pump it into the arterial system, and in that process you oxygenate the blood, yes. Right, what's going to happen then? When the heart grabs a bucket load of blood, a stroke volume worth of blood from the venous side, and dumps it into the arterial side, what's going to happen? Well, are the pressures in these two going to remain equal? So, let's say that the original pressure was P0 in the arterial system and P0 in the venous system. So let's say P0 represents the pressure at time zero. So if we have our time axis here, so this is time here, then P0 represents the pressure at time zero. So initially the pressures in both the arterial and venous system were the same because they were completely in equilibrium. There was no net movement. We've let it, they were completely the same. Now, we've moved a bucket load of blood, a stroke volume's worth of blood, from the venous system to the arterial system. That's going to mean that the blood pressure in the arterial system is going to go up because you're forcing that bucket load of blood into this container, which is already full, basically. And you can imagine that this is, uh, it's not a rigid container. Obviously, you're not going to be able to force liquid into a rigid container. Instead, you can imagine it's like an elastic balloon or something. So we're forcing this blood into this balloon an unburstable balloon, we'll imagine, and uh, we're taking the blood out of this balloon. That's going to cause the pressure in this venous system to go down. So, what should I call this now? Hmm. Um, the, blah, 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 blah. We'll call it um, P venous. We'll have to put, we're going to have to separate off our notation. We'll call it V1, basically. Okay, so how should I plot this? I'm trying to think of a good way of showing you this. Um, so basically, if we, I think I'll draw it as like this. So I'll draw it as a bar chart. So we'll have, this is the arterial system, this is the venous system, and we'll plot pressure on here. Now, we started off with them both at the same, as being the same, and I've managed not to draw them level, that's just brilliant. Uh, these are supposed to be the same, I'll fudge it by them. Um, colouring them in and then getting them on level. There we go. So the per pink there represents uh, the two being at the same level at time zero. Now let's have time two, time one rather, in blue. Okay, so what's happened is the arterial pressure has gone up and the venous pressure has gone down basically. So we'll do this in blue. So blue represents time two, and that's after you've got your first heartbeat. So let's say here's where the heart beats first time. So this is your blue here. Okay, so the heart beats, and the arterial pressure goes up, and the venous pressure goes down. Now, what does that mean? Well, if the pressure in the arterial system is greater than the pressure in the venous system, blood is going to move from the arterial system to the venous system. So you're starting to get a flow, basically, from the arterial system to the venous system, and it will be proportional, the size of this flow. And flow is often denoted with this capital letter phi, or it's also often denoted as Q. It will be proportional to the difference in pressure between these two, so delta P, i.e., 
it will be di proportional to this the, the higher pressure, the arterial pressure, subtract the venous pressures, and this is delta P here. Okay, now, a certain amount of blood is going to flow from the arterial system to the venous system, okay, uh, in a certain amount of time. So, in a certain amount of time, you'll get a certain amount of blood being moved from this one to this one. Now, the question is this. This heart that I've installed into our system up here, it's going to beat every second, let's say, to keep it nice and simple. The heartbeat is usually 70 beats per minute, uh, but we'll say it's a beat per second to keep it simple. Uh, beats per minute, so that's slightly more than a beat every second. Okay, um, but we'll say it's uh, a beat per second to keep it nice and simple. Okay, now the question is this. Our heart is going to move this stroke volume every time it goes, okay? The question is, Will the same amount of blood have the, enough time to flow back from the arterial system to the venous system in that time interval between consecutive heartbeats? Sure, if we left these two systems forever, what would happen is eventually they'd reach equilibrium. The arterial system would pump all, well, not pump, it would push all the blood that the heart had moved in that first stroke volume that was pumped from the venous to the arterial system it would move all that blood back into the venous system if we gave it enough time, but we're not giving it enough time. Instead, what we're doing is we're getting this heart to pump another stroke volumes worth of blood from the venous system to the arterial system, okay? And basically, this next heartbeat will happen before all of the blood that was moved in the first heartbeat has had time to move back into the venous system. So you will still have too much blood in here, basically. It won't have time to return back to that initial equilibrium where they both have the same pressure. So yes, the blood uh, will start to flow back and that will reduce this pressure down and move this pressure back up as blood leaves here and goes back into here. But it won't have time to return to normal. Okay, so when another heartbeat occurs, and we'll do this in green, what's going to happen is that's going to move another stroke volume across. So you're now going to have an even larger volume on here. You're going to have the original volume that you started off with at time zero, plus a whole stroke volume, plus that bit of the stroke volume that was left over from the first beat that didn't have time to move back. So your blood pressure is now going to go up still more. So your pressure in the arterial system is going to go up even more. And then your pressure in the venous system is going to drop down even more. This process will continue, basically, until, until the pressure difference between the arterial and the venous system gets so large that the flow through this tube in that time difference between consecutive beats is equal to the amount that the heart keeps beating. So, you'll build this up and up and up until this pressure is large enough to produce you a flow through this tube uh, that will be big enough, basically, to return all the blood from the arterial system to the venous system that is pumped on every heartbeat, okay? So that is the point that you reach equilibrium. When, you, when the two pressures get... Um, different enough, that the difference between them is large enough to produce a flow of blood through this tube connecting the two that is going to deliver the same amount of blood back from the arterial system to the venous system as is moved by the heart in a certain amount of time. I.e., if we look at the next heartbeat here, let's say this was the correct one now. So this change in pressure between these two green ones is now great enough that the flow from the arterial system to the venous system under that pressure difference is equal to the stroke volume, basically. Well, the amount of blood that flows in this time interval between consecutive heartbeats, so let's call this time interval tau here, okay? So this is a certain amount of time, which is, we, we, we said, roughly a second, basically, because we were assuming that our heart beats 60 times in a minute rather than 70. Okay, so it's roughly a second. Basically, a certain amount of blood will move from the arterial system to the venous system in that second, uh, and that will be determined by the pressure difference between them. Now, we're going to assume that this green pressure difference now, the pressure difference between here and here, is great enough that the flow of blood 
through this tube in a second is going to equal the stroke volume. Then, basically, the amount of blood you will have returned will be equal to the amount that the heart is now going to move in the opposite direction. So, basically, you've reached an equilibrium because the heart will return that stroke volume and then the heart will, sorry, the, the blood vessels will return the stroke volume, then the heart will put it back again, then the blood vessels will return it, and you'll just go round and round in a circle, and it will be at a nice equilibrium. So eventually you get to these equilibrium pressures of the arterial system and the venous system. And the usual pressures um, at which these are at equilibrium is that the venous pressure will be between 3 and 8 millimeters of mercury okay now the arterial system is slightly more complicated the arterial system has two sorts of blood pressure because when the heart initially pumps blood in that is when the arterial system is going to be at its highest pressure when the heart's just pumped the blood in force this stroke volumes worth of blood into the arterial system then the arterial system will be at its highest pressure then what it's going to gradually do in that time interval between the heartbeat that's just happened and the next heartbeat which is roughly a second it's going to force the blood back into the venous system through this tube uh, through the arterioles the capillaries and then the venules okay now uh, that means the blood pressure will be going down in the arterial system all the time and that decrease is not insignificant basically so that's why we talk about two different uh, blood pressures so the systolic blood pressure systolic blood pressure uh, this means uh, the blood pressure the pressure in the arterial system uh, when the heart has just ejected a stroke volumes worth of blood from the venous side to the arterial side i.e. it's the maximum blood pressure that will be in this arterial system at any point and this is usually between 90 and 119 millimeters of mercury okay now after that blood has been pushed in what will happen is the arterial system will be pushing the blood uh, through the arterioles, through the capillaries, through the venules, back into the venous system. So the blood pressure will fall and fall and fall and fall until the heart then bump, pumps another blood in, uh, another stroke volumes worth of blood in. Okay. Now just before the heart pumps that uh, next stroke volumes worth of blood in, that will be when the arterial blood pressure is at its lowest. Now that lowest possible value is what's known as the diastolic blood pressure. Okay, so diastolic blood pressure. And by the way, if people say blood pressure to you, what they generally mean is arterial blood pressure. No one's interested in venous blood pressure. Um, this is this three to eight millimeters of mercury. What if you were to talk about that, you would call it the central venous pressure. I should have said this at the time actually when I wrote that down, uh, because. Um, if you measure the blood pressure in different veins, you'll find different answers. It's always very low, but um, this is the pressure you will find in the superior and inferior vena cavi, basically, 3 to 8 millimeters of mercury. So it's very, very low, and people aren't really interested in that. These ones are the important ones, the arterial blood pressures. So when people say blood pressure, they don't mean venous blood pressure. They mean, strictly speaking, arterial blood pressure. And also, strictly speaking, they should talk about whether they mean systolic or diastolic blood pressure. Now, diastolic blood pressure, this lowest possible value uh, that you have within a cardiac cycle, uh, this is usually between 60 and 79 millimeters of mercury okay right so this overall then is a brief reminder of the hemodynamic model of how the cardiovascular system is working in this equilibrium uh, between blood being moved from the venous to the arterial system by the heart and the movement of blood back from the arterial to the venous system via uh, this flow through the capillaries Okay, in the next video, what we'll talk about is how nitric oxide regulates blood pressure.